Pastors, Pastor Ben Prescott from Orange County preached one night and he said something very powerful. And at the time, I was sitting by my girlfriend, who is now my wife, and he said, I believe tonight that everybody in this room will be marked by the Holy Spirit. And it stuck with us for literally a year. So my wife and I were driving down the road one day and just felt the presence of God. And we wrote this song while driving. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't just go home, so we just circled around the block, and we wrote the song. 
we wanted to share this prayer with you today. And she said something very powerful. The Bible says, the scriptures say, that God is searching throughout all the earth, looking for somebody who has a heart devoted to him. And she said something incredible where she said, is it possible to tell God he can stop searching because he found it here? Is it possible to stop searching, God, because you found your yes at Free Chapel? We lift our hands, God, in our hearts, and we say, here we are, you can use us. You can fill us with your Holy Spirit. You can fill us with honesty and clarity as we lift our hands, unreserved to worship you, God, and our prayer for now and to the end of time is here we are. We say yes, we say yes, so one last time. singing that chorus it just dawned on me maybe you arranged it maybe you were thinking about it but early in the worship set God says to us I am and we answered him here am I it's a wonderful wonderful communication between God and us amen will you lift your hands up Lord we thank you that you are the great I am and we say to you here am I Use me, send me, call me, speak to me, transform me, mark me, claim me. I thank you, God, that you are the great I am. And we can say to you in all humility, here am I. Use us. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. While you're standing, will you please greet all the other campuses as they join us? Come on, make them know they're right in the house. Right in the house with us. And all of those that are joining online from all over the world, we do not believe that you are our viewing audience. You're here in the house, our congregation. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. What a spirit of worship. I love that new chorus. <clears throat> I want to uh, give you a very special and personal invitation to come uh, this Wednesday night for midweek service. Uh, as you know, Allison and I began a girl's home called House of Grace in northern Thailand, 1986. We just began with four girls. Now it's a world-class home, 120 girls at any given time, and we have alumni that are in all kinds of places. We are bringing to the United States, and their first appearance will be here at Free Chapel this Wednesday night, a dance team they do classical Thai dancing and tribal dancing. They're called Tenra. And uh, I'm going to put their picture up on the screen. Here's some of our beautiful girls in their tribal costume and their classical Siamese. And they'll be here this Wednesday night. Allison and I and all of the girls from House of Grace invite you to be here this Wednesday night. And uh, you're going to be blessed with these beautiful girls and their grace and their dedication to the Lord. Not one of them was a Christian when they arrived at our home, and all of them are now. Amen? Now, if you have your Bibles, if you'll take those, and let's plunge right straight into the Word of God. If you'll turn to 2 Kings chapter 13, if you will, please. 2 Kings 13, beginning with verse 14.
Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he, was, he died, or he was to die. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto Elisha and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Take a bow and arrows. And he took his, him bow and arrows, and he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said to him, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. For thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, and thou shalt have, con have them consumed. And he said, Now, take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him, angry with him, and said, Thou shouldst have smitten five or six times. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou had consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabite, Moabites invaded the land at the coming of the year. Now, if you will, I just want to read on to verse 25, but the story shifts. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, raiders, bandits, and they just cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. But Hetzal, the king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoaz, and the Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. And he would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Hatzael, the king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his stead. And Jehoash, the son of Johaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hatzael, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoaz his father by war, three times, just as he had smitten arrows. Do you see? Three times did Joash beat him and recover the cities of Israel. Now let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in these next few moments, I pray that your spirit will so deal with us that when we leave here today, we will say, surely the Lord hath touched my spirit. I believe you for it. I thank you for it in advance. In the wonderful name, Jesus the strong Son of God. Amen. I want to preach this morning a simple message called asking for more. It depends a great deal on how we understand who God is, what is God like, and what is prayer like. There is a balance to be sure. On the one hand, we don't want to be greedy a shopping list, constantly coming to God, give me this, give me this, give me that. On the other hand, some people tend to think of God as the angry and parsimonious headmaster of a poverty-stricken boy's home, and that when we go to him and ask for anything, he's just angry with us. The picture might look something like this video. Is that your idea of God? Is this your God, this angry headmaster 
who just gives you this tiny little portion of gruel and is angry at you if you ask for more, if that's your God, your God is my devil. I believe that God is a God who wants to bless us. He's a God who promises us life and that more abundantly. Now, obviously, there's a balance. And the hardest thing in theology and scriptural theology is balance. It's easy to get off on one side or the other. We're not using God to get stuff. There's all the goofy things that go with it. You find somebody marching or doing a Jericho march around their neighbor's Jaguar and claiming it by faith. <laughs> but what, a, what about the issue of simply asking God for more, for abundance, for all the things that he wants? How can we ask for more? When do we ask for more? I, I believe that there's nothing at all wrong with simply going to God and saying, Lord, I'm, I'm asking you humbly to increase the blessings in my life. There are things that we can do to open that flow. As I've said from this very platform many, many times, and as you've heard elsewhere your whole life, we open the flow of blessings when we bless. If we ask God to bless us and we are a blessing, then he blesses us to be a blessing. So as we give more, God is gracious to, to pour his blessings on us. But you've heard that. I, I, that's not anything new. I want to give you today three places where I believe that it's perfectly okay to ask for more. And a friend of mine some years ago, well, an acquaintance of mine, he and I were preaching back to back at a camp meeting some years ago, and he was really going on and on and on about people constantly asking God for more. And he said people are never satisfied. They're just constantly asking God for more. And I just said to him, I said, but you see, the problem is what you're not taking into account is that our God is the God of more. God wants to do more. God wants to give more. God wants to bless more. When we ask for more, we are in alignment with the character and nature of God. Now, that's not about selfishness and greed. It's about being blessed. And so this guy said to me, I don't pray for my people to have more. I said, well, let me ask you a question if I could. What if somebody came to your office and said, Pastor, I'm believing God to bless me this year with a million dollars that I can give to this church. Would you pray for him to have that? He said, well, in that case, I think I might pray for him to have more. <laughs> you see, it all depends on how you look at it. Now, here are three places where I'm absolutely confident that anybody anywhere can pray for more. The first is this one, which we just read from two kings. I believe that we should ask God, I want more victory in my life. I think that many, many Christians live their lives at a marginal level of victory. Now, the victory has been won. The victory is ours. It's totally ours. The enemy is defeated. Satan's only power is his power to intimidate and threaten us. He cannot really do anything to us. He is bound and defeated. But he is, he's, uh, he is like a, a, somebody playing a Halloween trick. He gets in the closet and rattles his chains. He, he moans and screams and howls and tries to make Christians intimidated. But really, he has nothing to say to us. He can't do anything to us that we will not allow him to do. Many, many years ago... Many, many years ago, when I first began in coaching, before we went into the ministry, when uh, Lincoln was in the White House, I, I coached a, an inner city team uh, at, a, at the high school level. It was not a high school team, but it was a high school informal team. And uh, it, was, it was an interesting experiment. There were an urban team. I didn't have any white kids on the team. I also didn't have any cleats. Uh, the, the, all the boys played in tennis shoes. Nobody could afford any cleats. It was ill-equipped. They were magnificently talented. And yet, at the same time, they just didn't, they didn't have, even have complete uniforms for everybody. Sometimes I had to just take a T-shirt and write the number on it with magic marker and that kind of thing. Well, we had an undefeated season. We went through the whole season undefeated. And then we were going to play a little area championship against another team from the other side of the city. Had, that had also gone undefeated. It was just, you know, a small little championship team. So we went there in a beat-up old yellow school bus, 
and we drove up to this stadium that we had never been to before. And when we got there, the other team had gotten there ahead of us. And the coach had decided to do gamesmanship. Now, let me just say this to you. Don't try to game gamers. It's always a mistake. And he had lined his team up. They had beautiful uniforms. Gold, solid gold helmets. Every boy held a solid gold helmet under his right arm, gleaming in the stadium sun, uh, lights. Had beautiful jersey on, gold pants with a green stripe down the side. They looked like Notre Dame lined up there. Lined up so that our beat up old school bus had to go down the row right in front of that team. And they're all standing there like this. I had scouted this team. And I knew that there was not really any chance we could beat them. They were bigger and stronger and certainly better coached. They were big, strong, powerful athletes. My team was fast and fun, but not big and strong and not well coached. And I knew we didn't have a chance with this team. When I saw them all lined up there, I turned to the bus driver and I said, Howard, pull over to the side of the road. And I just got up and said to my little team there, I said, boys, look at them over there. We're going to have to drive right along there. I said, they're trying to intimidate you. What they're saying to you is, we, we don't think anything of you. They're saying we see your crummy uniforms and we see your beat up school bus and we're lined up here showing you exactly who's going to win this game. I said, now I don't, I don't know if you want to make any kind of a response to that. I'm just letting you know what's going on here. To this day, I don't know how they knew what to do. As one man, without anybody ever suggesting it, they sprang to the side of the bus where it was going to go by them. And you remember the old windows, the depression windows? They grabbed them and slid them down like that, and they leaned out those windows out to their waist. And as we drove along, they leaned over and banged on the side of the bus, and they said, we're going to beat you. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> All the way down there, we're going to beat you. Ooh, ooh. And I said, drive slow, Howard, drive slow. <laughs> and I looked into the eyes of those little boys and I said, we got it. I could read their minds. I looked at the quarterback, number 14. He was talented, big, strong. He could have played any position on the field. And I knew that he could beat us alone. And I looked into his eyes and I could read his mind. He said, oh my God, they've got knives. We beat that team 42 to nothing. They never scored. We beat that team. We beat that team before the referees showed up. We beat that team before the opening whistle. We beat that team in the parking lot. When we learn the victory that is ours, we beat Satan in the parking lot. Never settle for good enough. Be bold, be strong, claim your victory. When Elisha hands the king those arrows and he says, now hit the arrows on the ground. And the king says, one, two, three. So how's that? Elisha says, man, why did you stop? Why didn't you do it five times or six times? There's no magic in the number. He didn't mean just five or six. Why didn't you do it more? That's the whole point. Why didn't you claim more victory? Why were you satisfied with three victories? Go on, beat the enemy senses, keep pounding the arrows, ask for more, believe for more, receive more, and claim God's victory more and more areas of your life. Don't let the enemy off the hook. Now, let me tell you one of my coaching experiences that wasn't quite as glorious. At another point, I, coached, I also coached basketball, and at one point I was coaching a high school girls basketball. Frankly, I really enjoyed coaching girls because they didn't know everything. <laughs> if you've ever coached boys, you, you know nothing that they don't know. They're 16, they know everything. 16-year-old girls are actually coachable. But we had a really, really good team, and we were winning one game by about 25 points going into the fourth quarter. And I benched my first team. I thought, sportsmanship, don't run the score up on these poor little pathetic girls. And I had my first team sit down. 
the drop-off from my first team to my second team was probably a 30-point drop-off. And we were only 25 points ahead. With just a couple of minutes left to go in the game, we had been up 25 points. The score was tied. My assistant coach came over to me and she said, you realize if we lose this game, we're both going to look like idiots. And I called a timeout and I benched the second string and put the first string back in. And we won by four points. But it was a very scary operation. And I want to tell you what I learned. I no longer believe in sportsmanship. <laughs> I say, run the score up. <laughs> Beat them. Demoralize them. Send them home weeping and crying. <laughs> don't let the enemy off the hook. I mean, don't just, don't just beat them, whoop them. You know, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> no, it's ministry. It's ministry. Look, if they beat you, God cannot speak to the team that beat you. They get in their bus, they're happy, they're laughing, they're telling jokes. God can't get in their bus. But if you beat them senseless, if you demoralize them, they get in their bus, it's quiet, they're crying and everything, God can access them. That's ministry. <laughs> now, I will say this. When you're dealing with the devil, he's no gentleman. He's playing for keeps. You play for keeps. Ask God for more victory in your life. Now, if you will, turn back in 2 Kings, if just a little bit, to 2 Kings chapter 2. These are not in chronological order. I want to speak today on the second session on more anointing. 2 Kings chapter 2, I want to read the first 14 verses. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, and Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, tarry here, wait here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said unto him, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forward, came forth to Elisha and said unto him, knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he said, yes, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Jericho. And Elisha said, as the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee, hear, for the Lord hath sent me to Jordan, that is, on the other side of the Jordan River. And he said, As the Lord liveth and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood to view afar off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided thither, so that the two went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither. And Elisha went over. There is a second time that I can assure you God is pleased for you to ask for more. For more anointing. More usefulness. More of the power of God for ministry and effectiveness to live for him and serve him. 
But you must understand, it also means more responsibility. Now, the prophets who had been looking to Elijah, remember as they stopped at, Beth, as, at Gilgal, they stopped at Bethel, they stopped at Jericho, there were all of these prophets who had received from the Holy Spirit the inspirational revelation that Elijah was about to go to heaven. They all knew it. When Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's anointing, he knew that when he came back across the Jordan, back to Gilgal, back to Jericho, back to Bethel, that all of those prophets were going to be looking to him. So when we ask for a double portion of God's anointing, we have to understand that it also means increased responsibility, increased leadership. I, I am absolutely confident that there are Young, inexperienced preachers all over America, all over the world by the use of the internet. They watch what Jensen Franklin does with Forward Conference and preaching this world series that he's been doing, this world a journey with, uh, with Hillsong in Sweden and Australia and England and elsewhere. They watch Jensen here on this great platform and they see the thousands that are here in all of our uh, buildings on any given Sunday morning, 23,000 people. And I'm absolutely confident that those young preachers look up at that and say, that looks like an easy job. That looks great. They're not struggling with this little church, not struggling with what I have to face. They're not struggling with all the difficulties. And I suspect that they say, Lord, give me a double portion of what's on Jensen Franklin. I'm not saying that's a bad prayer. That's a good prayer. Ask for it. Brother Franklin, if I know him at all, he would join you in that prayer and agree with you that God would give you a double portion. But I just want to say this to you. When you receive that, you also receive the burden of this kind of leadership, the burden of this kind of management, the burden of this. One young pastor came to me when I was the president at Oral Roberts University. He said, will you pray for me that God will give me a church of thousands? He said, my, my church is, is just a couple of hundred people. We're hanging by a thread. Pray for me that God will give me a church of thousands. I said, I sure will. I said, I want to ask you a question, son. In your church of a couple of hundred people on any given Sunday morning, how many people in that building are absolutely straight out demon possessed? He said, well, probably two or three. I said, I just want you to know something. That percentage of demon possessed people sustains throughout the growth of your ministry. So when you have thousands of people in the building, he said, you know what? I'm not sure I'm ready for this prayer. <laughs> there is nothing at all wrong with asking for increased anointing and for the growth of your ministry. Years ago, when we first started in ministry, Allison used to pray for me all the time a certain prayer. She would pray aloud in my hearing, God, don't take Mark any further or any higher than you can sustain him. Don't take him any further, any faster. Don't promote him any faster than you can sustain him. Can I just be honest with you this morning? When I was 26, 27 years old, I found that prayer slightly irritating. <laughs> I, I always wanted to say to her, I knew it didn't sound spiritual, it didn't sound Christian, so I didn't do it, but I always wanted to say to her, hey, you know, Let's let God take me just as fast and high as he wants to. Then we'll believe for sustaining. But the fact of the matter is, she was right. Believe God for increased anointing. When you're going to do soul winning, you're going to witness to somebody, ask God, give me more. Give me more anointing. Give me more of the, of the power. Make my ministry more effective. If you're going to speak to a Bible study of six people, do not settle for the anointing that you've known the last time you spoke there. Ask God for an increased anointing. Say, God, may my words be anointed. As they go forth from my mouth, may they be anointed. Ask God for more. Then there is the third. If you'll turn to Acts chapter 4, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 4 in the New Testament, verses 21 through 31. Now, let me just set the scene for you. Peter and John have been arrested. They have been charged with blasphemy. They have been rebuked. They've been hauled before the Sanhedrin, the highest level of religious court. 
They have been admonished, threatened, told never to preach about Jesus anymore, not to do any more miracles in Jesus' name. They said, the Sanhedrin said, we want this stopped. The most powerful religious court in the land. And they have just this little cluster of Christians. And Peter and John go back to their people. Now here it is. We'll begin reading. Verse 21. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. For the man was above 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing was shown. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. Now just look, pause right there. In other words, they told them the truth. We've been threatened, we've been admonished, and we have been commanded not to preach Jesus or to do any more miracles in his name. They're not lying to the church. They tell the church exactly what has happened. So when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ, for of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together, for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings. Pause again. They're saying, Lord, look what these people are saying to us. Look how they're threatening us. Look at the great danger we're in. Doesn't it seem like the next thing out of their mouths would be protect us, give us wisdom, show us how to be safe? Doesn't it look like they would say, God, look at all these horrible things that are being threatened against us. God, show us how to find a safe place. But that's not exactly what it says. And now, Lord, verse 29, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The third thing that I want to mention to you today that you can with great liberty at all times ask God for is more of the Holy Spirit, more of boldness, more healings, more miracles, more signs, more wonders. When we ask God for these things, he wants to give them. Now, some people say, I don't understand why these people are seeking more of the Holy Spirit. Weren't they just a few chapters before at the upper room, weren't they just baptized in the Holy Spirit? What happened to the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Where did that go? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is that initial experience of empowerment by the Holy Spirit for holiness of heart and power in ministry. However, at various times in your life, at transition moments, at new opportunities of ministry, at new challenges, there is nothing at all wrong and everything right biblically with saying to God, God, I know that I'm a Christian. I know that Jesus died for me. If I were to die right now, I know I'd go to heaven. I know that I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit. I thank you for that. But God, for this moment, for this thing, for this opportunity, for this challenge, for this opposition, I need more of the Holy Spirit. I need you to pour out a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on me for this moment. These people are fresh from the pyrotechnics of the upper room, and they're still asking, God, give us more. If that is for the veterans and the alumni of the upper room university, how much more for us that we say, oh God, for today, for this moment, for this challenge, give me more. Give me more of the Holy Spirit. Now, I do want to say to you, when you pray for more boldness, for more healings, for more signs, for more wonders, for more of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, for more of the Holy Spirit, I do want to say to you, it's going to also mean more opposition. I need you to hear what I'm saying. I never like to jerk an audience around. I, I, I don't want to say to you everything's just going to be hunky-dory because God's given you more of the Holy Ghost. 
The more blessing, the more anointing, the more power, the more ministry you have, the more opposition will be raised up against you. Those things often go hand in hand. Years ago, when I first began in missions, Dr. Mark Nicewander and I were in Monterey, uh, in a colonia there where there was no church. And we were there to preach a crusade, and we hoped to plant a church. We met in the walled courtyard of a big house, and it was just packed with people. We put chairs out, and then there weren't enough chairs, and people were on the ground. They were everywhere. And against the back wall stood eight very, very dangerous hombres. It was a local gang. Everybody told me who they were. They were standing against the back wall with their arms crossed, and they were just glaring. Knives were coming out of their eyes. They were just glaring at us. And so we said to everybody, all right, watch them, and let's make sure what happens, but let's believe God. And we began to worship, and we could see rain coming toward us, and then it began to rain on us. Somebody came out with the brilliant idea there were clotheslines, and they put bed sheets out over us. Do you know a bed sheet does nothing for you? Those sheets began to fill up with rain. They bulged down. They dropped rain. And I went over to Mark Nicewander. He was sitting on that side of the courtyard. I was on this side. And I went over to him and I said, Mark, I, I believe that God wants to do something miraculous here. I said, I, I believe that he would be pleased if we would pray to stop this rain. And, and maybe he'll give us a witness with that gang in the back. He said, that really witnesses with my spirit. Give me the microphone. He took the microphone, went up to the front, and he said to the people, he said, in Spanish, he said to the people, God has revealed to Brother Rutland that he's going to stop the rain, and he's going to come and pray now. <laughs> I'm sitting there thinking, no, I just made a suggestion, and you asked for the microphone. So I came up, never has a prayer for a miracle been prayed with less confidence and boldness. I, I didn't even pray in Spanish. I told the interpreter, do not translate this. God speaks English. He can get it if he wants to. And I just prayed, God, here we are. You see the gang in the back. It's raining on us. We humbly ask. God is my witness. If you don't believe me, you can call Dr. Mark Nicewander and ask him. In a matter of seconds, the rain rained on that side of the courtyard. It rained in the back of the courtyard. It rained on that side of the courtyard, and it rained in the street. And over us, it was as dry as it could be. Not one drop of rain fell on that crowd. Now I was filled with boldness said, give the man of God the microphone. <laughs> and I preached, and I gave the invitation, and I said, the God who can stop the rain can stop the nightmare in your life. And the head of that gang came out and came to the front and gave his life to Christ. The next night, all of the gang members were with him at the front. I'm not 100% sure that they were convicted in their heart. I think it was just that he made them. But the whole gang, two years later, I went back to that same colonia, and there was a beautiful Pentecostal church there, El Templo Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem Temple, there. And those eight gang members were the elders of Temple Jerusalem. <laughs> so what am I saying? I'm saying it's... It's with a free and willing spirit that we can ask God. God, give me more of the Holy Spirit. Give me more boldness. Give me more faith. Give me signs and wonders. Give me healings. Give me this. And God says, yes, and I also send gangs. That's where we often say, here am I, Lord. Send somebody else. What can we say then? Don't settle for halfway measures. Ask God for more victory, total victory. Don't settle for things as they are. Don't settle for half measures. Run the score up on your enemy. Ask for more victory. Believe God for more anointing, 
for greater responsibility, greater leadership, that God would widen the tent pegs of your tent, that God would take you out further, deeper, higher. But understand that increased usefulness means increased pressure, increased difficulty. Pray for more of the Holy Spirit. Pray for more boldness, more healings, more signs and wonders. But understand that, the op- that opposing forces are not going to delight in what God is doing for you. Can we find the liberty to pray for more? In Genesis chapter 13 and verse 2, God blesses Abraham. It says he is blessed with things and with people and with livestock. In Isaiah chapter 51 verse 2, it says God wants to bless him and increase him. Genesis 26, 12, it, it say, in Genesis 12 through 14, it says, and Isaac or Isaac was blessed and prospered of God. 1 Chronicles 29, it says David was given riches and honor. In 2 Chronicles 17, it says that Jehoshaphat was given riches and honor in abundance. In Matthew chapter 27, Joseph of Arimathea is blessed. He is prospered. He is a businessman of wealth and prominence and influence. He has the governor of Judea on his speed dial. When Jesus' body hangs naked and dead on the cross, it is Joseph of Arimathea who calls up the governor on his speed dial and says, let me take care of the body of Christ. What am I saying to you then? I am saying that God is a God of blessings. We don't have to come like Oliver Twist, fearful up to the throne of God and say, more please. We don't have to worry that God will be angry. We don't have to worry that God says, who do you think, who do you, think you are asking for more? God is a God of blessings. Please understand the balance. I'm not talking about using God for greed. I'm talking about saying to God, bless me that I may be a blessing. Anoint me that I may be useful. Give me victory that I may walk in victory. Give me more of the Holy Spirit that despite all opposition, I may speak with boldness, the boldness of the line of the tribe of Judah. I do not believe that God wants you to live at the level of spiritual, emotional, financial, and relational poverty. I believe that God wants to give you more. I believe this with all my heart. Now, look, I know the risk. I know the risk that I run in preaching this message. I know the risk that I run. And it is that somebody will say, okay, this is just another prosperity preacher. Just telling everybody how they can get rich off of Jesus. I have tried to give you as much balance as I understand from the Scripture. That we're not talking about exploiting God to get rich. We're talking about saying, God, I don't want to live in the margins. I want to stand in the middle of your promise. I want to give them life and that more abundantly. How can you have more abundantly if you leave out the word more? There is nothing wrong with asking God for more so that you may be used more, blessed more, blessed more. I've said this just as clearly as I know how to do, but if there was any way in which I miscommunicated, I'm believing the Holy Spirit will make it clear in your heart. Now, I want to pray for you in just a moment. I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. But if you're, if you're sitting there saying to yourself, I, I just don't believe in this. I'm not going to ask God for more. I'm not going to pray for blessings. I, I don't believe in that. That's just, that's just some kind of cheap gospel. Then don't pray. Then don't pray. I'm not trying to manipulate you or force you into anything. But if you would say, I want to pray that God will bless me in the coming year. Students, faculty, teachers, in this coming school year and in the coming year between now and this, this date in 2018, if you would say, I want God to bless me more financially that I can give more than I've ever given in my life. I want God to bless me physically so that I can be stronger to serve him more than I've ever had in my life. If there's some area of your life, if you say, look, we've had a little ray of sunshine in our family. It's just beginning to come together. We're just starting to have some healing. Why be satisfied with that? 
Why not say, God, we want more in our family. We want more blessing. We want more unity, more healing. There is nothing wrong with asking God for more unless you're asking the wrong way. And if you want to pray that, and if you want that, I'd like to pray with you. Put my faith with yours, and let's believe God in this coming year. Let's believe God for more. Amen? If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes all over the house. Heavenly Father, we don't want to ask amiss. We want to ask in faith believing and in all humility. We know that our enemy is defeated. We know that you rule and reign on high in the affairs of men. And yet we also know that your word is clear, that we have not because we ask not. And that if we would come before you and pray according to your will, we would have those things for which we pray. And we're believing you, God, for more. Help us to pray according to your will. Now, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you'd say, Dr. Mark, would you please pray for me? Please pray that God will give me more victory. I don't want to settle for the shelf where I am. I want to move up. I want to have more. I want to walk stronger in victory. If that's you, then you raise your hand right where you are. More liberty from bondage, more overcoming power, more ability to defeat the enemy. Thank God. Heavenly Father, we are asking you and we're believing you for more victory. We know the victory is won. We want that victory to be effectuated in our lives more and more and more. And we believe you for it in the wonderful name, Jesus. Now take your hands down and keep your eyes closed. Others will say, will you pray for me, Dr. Mark? Please pray for more anointing, more usefulness in ministry, a double portion of anything I've ever known. Give me the boldness to believe God for signs and wonders and miracles and effectiveness in ministry. Not not to make me famous, not to glorify myself, but that I may be more useful to God than I've ever been. I want to pray for more anointing. If that's you, then you raise your hand. Heavenly Father, you see our hands raised. Our hearts are also raised. God, we're, we're not asking you to make us famous or lift us up or shine a light on us. We're only asking God, give us anointing for ministry. Give us the usefulness, God, that where where we lay our hands, when we pray our prayers, when we preach our messages, when we just witness in our place of work, that the words will be anointed, that they would would go out and accomplish the purpose for which they were designed. We believe you, God, for more effectiveness in ministry, more anointing than we've ever known. God, I feel led to pray. I know there are preachers and ministers watching all over the world right now. I pray that you increase the anointing upon their lives, upon their ministry, that the next time they preach, even this very day maybe, that next time they preach, that their words would just be sharp and powerful and anointed. And I believe you, God, for the anointing to increase in their churches, church after church after church, nation after nation, knowing, God, knowing that you want to use them in a powerful way. Now take your hands down, but here's the third prayer. If you say, Dr. Mark, will you pray for me? That God will increase the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I want to be more spirit-filled, more loving, more forgiving, more of the fruit, more of the gifts. I want more of the Holy Spirit than I've ever known. Why would God be hurt with you for praying that? Lift your hand up if that's what you want. So many. Heavenly Father, we pray not for the not for just tiny little trickles, but the deluge, the river of the Holy Spirit. More and more and more on this church, on our lives, upon the churches that are watching, we pray, God, for an outpouring, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. More and more and more. We believe you for it, God, knowing all the time, even as we pray, that more anointing, more victory, more spirit may also mean more opposition. Give us boldness signs and wonders, and more of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, the strong Son of God. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, stand up and give the Lord a great praise. Magnify the Lord in this house. Now, will you look right up here? I want to give you a parting blessing. I want to give you a parting blessing. I hope you'll be back on Wednesday night. It's going to be a great service. See our beautiful girls dance. Be here next Sunday. Do not miss this great service of blessing and anointing through pastor. And uh, and it's going to be a great service. Now look right up here. 
Now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the communion and sweet, sweet fellowship of the Holy Ghost increase unto you more and more, more and more and more in all blessing and abundance, strength and anointing, blessing and victory. In Jesus' name, God bless you. God bless you, everybody. Incredible message we heard today by uh, Dr. Mark Rutland. And I want to encourage you as we take these next steps and as we're moving forward after today's service, one of the best things that you can do if you want to grow more in your relationship with Christ is to sign up for School of Discipleship Online. This is a four-phase discipleship program that will give you more of what you need in Jesus Christ. So go ahead and sign up today if you haven't already. Uh, freechapel.org forward slash SOD online. I promise you, you will not be disappointed because this program will completely transform your life. Again, that's freechapel.org forward slash SOD online. But we love you so much. We're thrilled that you joined us here today at Free Chapel, and we will see you next Sunday morning.